everyone. In this video, we're gonna talk about connective tissue, which is the final tissue type that we haven't really thoroughly addressed yet uh, for this particular section. And I think that connective tissue is a little bit more challenging than some of the other tissue types because instead of the focus being on the cells, so in epithelial tissue, it's obvious that we're focusing on epithelial cells of different shapes and different arrangements. When we talk about neural tissue, we're obviously focusing on neurons or nerve cells. When we talk about muscle tissue, we are focusing on muscle cells. In connective tissue, we're not really focusing on cells so much as we're focusing on the interaction of the cells in the extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix can actually be a more significant component. In fact, it is oftentimes a more significant component than the cells are. For example, when we think of bone, which is a connective tissue, only about 2% of the bone structure is actually cells, and the remaining 98% is the extracellular matrix. So we'll actually see after we sort of explore this tissue type that this makes a lot of sense, and it's, it's um, very relevant that this is the case, but I think that's why it sort of feels a little bit more abstract than some of the other uh, types. Another thing that's interesting and unusual about connective tissue is that the types of cells that we find are kind of variable and they all have really interesting functions. So there's generally two classifications for cell types in connective tissue, and they are resident cells and transient cells. So the resident cells are cells that are basically fixed. They stay in the connective tissue where they are. Um, they don't really migrate from blood vessels or to, you know, in and out of the connective tissue or, or that sort of thing. And I just want to highlight them quickly. We have the fibroblast and its closely related cousin, the myofibroblast, the macrophage, the adipocyte, the mast cell, and then some adult stem cells. And then our transient cell types, which basically mean that they can migrate from the blood vessels into the connective tissue and then back out again are primarily the white blood cells. And there's five types of white blood cells. We'll cover these when we do the blood and some other things, but we'll just name them quickly here. There are lymphocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes. And then we also have plasma cells. And um, don't be confused, plasma cells are actually cells that are part of the immune system that secrete antibodies. They're not plasma cells as in plasma, like blood plasma. Um, also, monocytes give rise to macrophages. So macrophages are like the uh, almost, not quite, but almost like the, a grown-up version of the monocyte. The extracellular matrix is comprised of two basic things, protein fibers, and the examples are collagen, elastic, and reticular fibers. And, um, and, and actually, collagen is kind of what gives us our, our strength and sort of holds things together, and elastic gives us our stretch, so they almost oppose each other. And then we have our ground substance. And the ground substance is basically a viscous, uh, which means very thick, clear substance, almost uh, maybe like corn syrup, maybe a little thicker. Um, it has a very high water content and some specialized molecules, mostly glycosaminoglycans. This is basically a molecule that contains sugar components that attract water. So it's actually kind of like a hydrated gel with a, a lot of negative charge. So the ratio of cells to protein fibers to ground substance is going to vary depending on the type of connective tissue we're considering. So some more cells and less, you know, fewer protein fibers or some more protein fibers and less ground substance. It all kind of depends on, on, uh, on the specific type. All right, so let's expand a little bit on some of the cell types that were, are worth mentioning. First, I wanna start with the fibroblast. So the fibroblast is basically a cell, it, it almost reminds me of, of, a, of a ghost um, and uh, because of its shape. And um, its function is to secrete collagen. Um, and, and so what we can see in this cell is we have a nucleus, we have our endoplasmic reticulum, we have our Golgi apparatus, and then we can see a bunch of vesicles and the vesicles uh, are traveling towards the, um, the, the membrane and then they'll perform exocytosis of the collagen so collagen is basically a very long peptide chain, and we start with a collagen molecule, and, and the molecules combine to form fibrils, and then the fibrils combine to form fibers. And so as the, um, as the collagen is exocytosed into um, the extracellular space, it's actually into the little cove right here, um, which is sort of this, um, it offers some protection during the exocytosis um, process so that the so that the collagen can assemble with other collagen that's already sort of present and um, and, and we can make um, some very uh, big collagen fibers. 
So the collagen is able to move into the ECF and become part of the ECF, and, uh, and we'll see some examples of this later on. Reticular fibers, we mentioned as another fiber type, are also made of collagen, um, so they're a little bit different, but they're, but they're, uh, they're made of collagen fibrils initially. And um, also elastic fibers are um, produced by fibroblasts as well. So I'm showing the example of collagen here, but we could have elastic fibers that we're making. And um, also elastic fibers are produced in smooth muscle cells. So this is not their only site of synthesis. Reticular fibers are not usually made by fibroblasts, usually by different cell types. The next classification of cell we wanna consider is the adipocyte, which is basically a fancy way of saying fat cell. And um, the fat cell is notable for uh, several things, but um, what we'll mention here is fat storage. So basically the storage happens in the form of uh, triglycerides. So what we can see in this cell is we have our nucleus and we have our other organelles and we have our cytosol. And, um, and then what we have in the middle is a, is a large uh, fat droplet. That's actually what it's called, fat droplet. And the fat droplet is almost like a balloon in the sense that it can inflate or, or, or deflate depending on um, how much storage of triglycerides is needed at any given time. This is not membrane bound. So it's not, it's not, um, it's just an accumulation basically of the triglycerides. And as the size of the fat droplet increases, we actually compress the cytoplasm around it. So it can get even bigger than what I've shown here. And if we have uh, an increase in weight or weight gain, we'll actually have an increase in the size of the fat droplets. And then when we have a decrease in weight uh, or weight loss, we'll have a decrease in the size of the fat droplets. One thing that's worth mentioning though is that um, we really can't um, ever decrease the number of adipocytes that we have. We can increase the number if we need to, but we really don't decrease. Uh, so if we have chronically elevated uh, lipid levels in the blood or in the body, uh, one thing that will happen is we'll actually increase the number of adipocytes. So short-term increase, we'll just increase the size of the fat droplet, but long-term increase, we'll actually get um, stem cell division, and um, these are actually called uh, mesenchymal cells, um, the type of stem cell, and they'll actually divide. So these adipocytes don't undergo cell division the way that we've shown in the past the stem cells have to give rise to new adipocytes, but once we have more, we won't ever be able to get rid of the extra ones either. We're stuck with them for life. And the last cell type I wanna mention here is the mast cell. And, um, and, and mast cells are, are really most notable for their release of certain uh, 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 chemicals in, in, in various situations. So the mast cell is kind of a, an, almost an oval shape and uh, we can see that it has all of our organelles. We have our nucleus, endoplasm, reticulum, Golgi. And then we have a bunch of granules. And um, they're actually called basophilic uh, granules. And they store uh, histamine and heparin. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a moment. We can also see around the outside border of the cell, we have uh, microvilli. So mast cells are derived from bone marrow. They're actually derived from uh, hematopoietic stem cells, which is the same stem cells that give rise to red and white blood cells. And, um, and so once the a mast cell is produced, it actually migrates to connective tissue. And um, it, there's a couple of things that happen sort of as it undergoes um, maturity and uh, and then is able to perform its particular function. So one thing that's going to happen is um, IgE binds. IgE is an antibody and it's specific for things like immune reactions and we'll cover this much much later um, and I really am more mentioning this now so you could look back later and sort of review it. Not so much that I'm gonna um, at, you know expect a lot of detailed information on IgE because we really haven't done enough with it. Um, an antigen is, is some type of chemical that will will bind um, almost uh, um, to like receptors on the antibodies that um, usually is an indicator of something bad. So if there's an allergic reaction or something happening, then we'll get um, an antigen that's going to bind to the IgE and sort of trigger the, the response. So whatever that particular, um, you know, whatever it is that is, is the allergen um, can trigger this sort of event. Um, and then we'll get what's called mast cell activation and then um, degranulation and exocytosis. So all of these basophilic granules that are containing histamine and heparin, they will perform 
uh, basically exocytosis and they will release all of their contents. Um, so sort of on command when triggered by the, the presence of a particular antigen or something that's bad in the body that, that the body says, oh, this is not going to work. Um, it will basically cause exocytosis of all of these granules. So all these little vesicles all um, in, in rapid succession. And they'll release histamine and heparin into the um, into the uh, connective tissue, and then and then in turn into the blood. And so um, heparin is uh, is basically an anticoagulant, and histamine is um, it actually promotes uh, increased vascular permeability and vasodilation. So it will help um, draw more uh, white blood cells and stuff to the area because it actually separates the endothelial cells a little bit, makes some room for them to come out. And, um, and, and sort of leak through the, the capillaries. So basically it makes the capillaries leaky, I guess would be a fair way to put it. And uh, later on we'll do an example of um, tissue injury and we'll be able to show this process a little bit more clearly. But histamine is a major mediator of inflammation uh, for this exact reason. It, it causes increased uh, capillary permeability and um, allows for uh, more stuff to leak out of those capillaries into the connective tissue where the mast cells are waiting. All right, so now that we've covered some of the cell types, I want to talk a little bit about the, the types of connective tissue. There are three general classifications for connective tissue. One is supporting connective tissue, and the supporting connective tissue is basically bone and cartilage. Um, and so we'll talk more about um, mostly bone when we do the skeletal system towards the end of the course. And um, a little bit, we'll talk about cartilage sort of intermittently and then in conjunction with bone. The next type is fluid connective tissue, which is blood and lymph, which is what fills lymph, uh, lymphatic vessels and basically makes up the immune system. So we'll cover those later on as well. And then there's connective tissue proper. And much like connective tissue, connective tissue proper is uh, it's it's sort of a tissue type where you you can find it everywhere um, in, in in various amounts so it's not really specific to one body system necessarily so we'll elaborate a little bit more on the connective tissue proper here just because there's a few important things to say about it connective tissue proper breaks down into loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue and dense connective tissue could be dense regular or dense irregular connective tissue, depending on the organization of the collagen and other fibers. So let's talk a little bit about loose connective tissue. Loose connective tissue is also called areolar connective tissue, so interchangeably those words. It is comprised of a thin sparse collagen fibers, so not very many. Definitely has some ground substance. And then it has a few cells like fibroblasts, um, but but um, it's, it's not as many uh, as, as some of the other cell types. Um, and then a lot of the cells that we'll find actually are migrated from the plasma. So largely our white blood cells uh, are going are gonna to join um, in the loose connective tissue. Loose connective tissue is usually found beneath the epithelia. So it's a site of inflammation and immune reactions. So when we have things like swelling, um, this is the tissue compartment where we're largely going to have the swelling. When we think of dense connective tissue, um, we'll also have fibroblasts present and um, we'll have very little ground substance. We're actually going to have many protein fibers, mostly collagen, and so lots and lots of collagen, very little ground substance because the more fibers there are, the less ground substance, the more densely packed they can be, um, and so therefore the, the sort of the stronger that tissue type is. Um, irregular dense connective tissue is uh, fibers that are arranged in bundles and oriented in various directions, whereas regular, dense regular connective tissue, um, the fibers are arranged in parallel. So we can see it's just a different arrangement for the connective tissue. When we think of irregular, we could think of some examples such as the reticular layer of the um, dermis, so the one of the deeper layers of the skin. And uh, we'll show this later on in, a, in another video. And then also we could think of the submucosal layer of the GI tract. Um, and so this is something that also we'll see later. The, I, I think these examples, I know they don't mean a whole lot right now, but I'm hoping that again, later on when we mention these things, we can look back and, and review the connective tissue component that we would find there. The dense regular connective tissue would include examples such as tendons and ligaments. Tendons connect muscle to bone, and ligaments connect bone to bone. 
the function of dense connective tissue largely is to resist tearing from stretch. So um, all of these examples will definitely have stretch. And we want to make sure that the structures stay intact. So that actually uh, that wraps up our overview of connective tissue. And we'll follow this up with um, maybe so, a, a quick discussion on membranes, uh, which is usually a combination of epithelial tissue and connective tissue, and, uh, and also an example of tissue injury and repair. But, uh, but this, this will kind of cover us for our, our, our overview, and um, some of the other examples, as we mentioned, such as bone and blood, will get more attention in, in separate sections. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.